And like the book of Revelation says, you're the only one worthy to open the scroll. Specifically, you're the only one worthy and you're the only one able to really do the will of God on this earth. You're the only one really fully able to do that. Uh, you're the only one really able to execute fully uh, as both God and man, the only one able to execute fully exactly what God the Father has in mind for this world. And so, yes, we, we do. Uh, we bow down before you and we worship you and we say that you're worthy to be praised today uh, because of your ability and your very nature but your ability to execute exactly what God has in mind on this earth. The restoration that he has in mind, the healing that he has in mind, the flourishing that he has in mind, the justice that he has in mind. But for this world to be set right, you're the only one able to execute that. And so we want to be extensions of you, Jesus. And so this morning we just say you're worthy. You're worthy to sing to. Uh, you're worthy to spend a few hours on a cold morning inside of this building thinking about you searching our hearts for places that we don't reflect you you're just worthy for us to, to do this together and so thank you Lord for, for the time thank you Lord for your spirit which is so sensitive thank you for that but we do and we intentionally do this we soften our hearts towards you Lord uh, we soften our hearts towards you. Holy Spirit, you, you dwell within us. You, have, you are a gift that God gave to us. You dwell within us. And so we turn to you and we say, Holy Spirit, we are softened towards you. Uh, and that Jesus, we turn to you and say, we are yours. You have bought us with a, with a huge price, huge cost to yourself that cost us nothing, cost you everything. You've purchased us. And so we gladly submit our lives to you. We gladly submit our families to you. We gladly submit the concerns of this week and, and our jobs and our careers, uh, our school, uh, all the things that we have to get accomplished, the important things that are in our hands to do. We submit all that to you. We want to become who you have in your heart for us to become. We want to accomplish what you have in your heart for us to accomplish. We want to mirror the life of Jesus in that way. We thank you for your grace. We're not perfect. We thank you for your grace. But we long, even still in our imperfections, to mirror that thing in Jesus, to be like him, to look like you. And so we soften ourselves this morning to encounter you, to really encounter you, not just to learn about you, but to encounter you be transformed into your likeness as we encounter you in Jesus name in Jesus name amen amen okay okay man it's not it's not a comparison thing at all but I, I just feel like y'all are the best band in the state of Texas like I, I'm, I love to worship with you guys like I really do we love to worship with you guys uh, you, you know we don't need microphones and we don't need the LED wall and we don't need the lyrics up there to actually worship, but it's so beautiful that we get to worship in that way. It's, it's really, really fun, really enjoyable. Um, okay, We're, we are in the middle of a, a sermon series. It's called Mosaic DNA. Uh, it's kind of got a subtitle, A House of Blank, um, because the reality is, is that uh, is I want you to got, you only get to get a hold of who we are as a church. Uh, who we are as a group of people, not just who we are as an organization, but who we are as an organism, who we are as a particular uh, facet of the bride of Christ in this point in history, in this point in time. Uh, and the way that we phrase that, the way that we shorthand talk about that, is that we're a house of breakthrough. We're a group of people that believe that God didn't just save you to keep you at a, at a, at a state of life that has no transformation and has no life and to just keep you there until he takes you to heaven one day. We believe that your life should be these uh, moment by moment series of breakthroughs where you, where you become more like Jesus, you resemble him in your, in your life, you grow to look like him more and you do the things that he did more so and more so in your life and that that happens in these series of breakthroughs. That there are times in our life that can be quite difficult 
and there will be times in our life where we break through that difficulty and the difficulties that we once lived in, we learn to step on top of them by the Spirit of God and we don't live in them anymore, right? Uh, and so it does not mean that we believe that just because we follow Jesus, there's nothing difficult in our life. It actually means that, no, we follow Jesus and we will follow him into difficulty, but that difficulty is not uh, gratuitous. It's not pointless. It's to bring about a particular thing in our life. It's to bring us to a, a greater degree of strength or the way the New Testament would, would talk about this. It's to go from one degree of glory to another degree of glory in that Jesus himself is glorious but he is also sharing his glory with his bride. It's a beautiful way that he is. It's a beautiful way that he is. And so that we are a group of people who believe that life in the Lord should not be the same day by day and month by month and year by year and always stuck in the same garbage, right? But that there should be series in our life of breakthrough. We also believe uh, that we are, the way that we're talking about it last week and this week, that we are a people of or we are a house of blessing, and that is something that is incredibly profound. It is layered throughout the Old Testament. It is layered throughout the New Testament. But it's very foreign to us as Westerners because we don't conceive of blessing in the way that the ancients did, in the way that the biblical authors did, in the way that Jesus did, or, the way, or, or in the way that those who followed Jesus did. And so uh, the reason that I'm spending a couple weeks on this uh, is, is a couple reasons. Uh, it's foreign to us, but it's foundational to the scriptures, and it's foreign to us, but it's foundational to the life of God's people. Uh, and, and if I can put it this way, more importantly, though, God himself is a God whose longing and heart and desire is to be a God who blesses. And I don't just mean that in some, like, he likes to give you a new truck occasionally, okay? Do you know what I mean? Uh, I don't mean this in a, in a shallow way. I mean that as soon as God created human beings, the first thing that he said to those human beings is he blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill this world and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds there. Flourish and cause flourishing around you. That's what I mean by blessing. Does that make sense? And when humans walked away from that, God came to a man named Abram, very like 12 chapters after all that went down, he comes to Abram in the book of Genesis again. He says, that all, of, all of human beings have walked away from me. They don't want to live in that life of blessing. They would rather define good and evil on their own. They would rather walk by their own ways. They'd rather do their own thing. Therefore, they don't live under my blessing anymore. They're stuck under this thing called a curse. And so he goes to Abram, who becomes Abraham, who becomes the father of the, the Jewish nation, of the Israelites. The entire Old Testament is about that nation. And it's about that nation's invitation to walk in the blessing of God and their continual rejection of walking in his ways and walking in his blessing. And so you're going to see in Abram, you're going to see in his son Isaac, you're going to see in his son Jacob, and then you're going to see in King David, and you're going to see in Moses, and you're going to see in all these figures of the Old Testament, there was an invitation for them to walk in a life of real flourishing where God's hand was on them, he was protecting them, he was providing for them, he was showing them what it looks like to walk through difficulty, but their life was intended to be a life of blessing. And that's the story of the Old Testament, and it's fulfilled in Jesus. It's specifically fulfilled in Jesus. And that's why Paul says in Ephesians 1, uh, he says, uh, blessed are you, blessed are you, and you've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. There's a reason that he says blessing three times. There's a reason why Jesus in his first, very first sermon in the book of Matthew he turns to the concept of blessing, and he goes through, blessed are the poor in spirit, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are you when others curse you and revile you for my namesake, right? He starts to talk about what it looks like to live a life of blessing, and it's, it's contrary to what we can call blessing, but it's quite profound and quite beautiful, and it is what Jesus opened the door to all of us when he said in Galatians these words, he said, why did Jesus die on a cross? Well, Jesus died on the cross so that you and me might walk in the blessing of Abraham, a set of promises given to a man thousands of years ago, and that you might receive his promised Holy Spirit. That's why Jesus died on the cross. Not simply to take you to heaven, but so that you might live a life of blessing in the here and now and to be an, a conduit of blessing to the people around you. Same thing again in Genesis 12. When, when uh, God goes to Abram, the father of the Israelite nation, and makes that problem, promise, he says, 
I will bless those who bless you, and I'll curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed, right? So to be a blessing, then to be a conduit or an extension of blessing to those around you, right? And so we got into the broad, big theological unpacking of that last week, uh, and you were riveted and transformed, like utterly. Um, it was crazy, right? Yeah. Um, and so we're going to spend, I wanted to spend some time this week getting into one very practical aspect of blessing. It's one very specific practical aspect of blessing because I want you to have something to take home. I want you to have something that you can uh, apply to your life in a very specific way outside of a theological concept. I want you to see how this gets played out in the mundane, sort of day in and day out uh, interactions of your life. Uh, It's very, very meaningful, very, very profound. It can reshape your home. It can change the way that you relate to your children. It can change the way that you relate to your spouse. Like there's a piece that I want to show you today that I think is absolutely profound for us living the life that God has for us to live uh, in a in a very particular way to be people of blessing. So the way that we're going to get there though is we're going to go to this story. Uh, about a man named Jacob. It's in Genesis 27. So if you have a physical Bible and you still carry that thing around, praise God for you. You are the salt of the earth. Um, And so open that thing up. We'll be in Genesis 27. We're actually going to look at all of that chapter today, all of Genesis 27. Uh, If you don't have your Bible, then uh, if you don't have a Bible on your phone, I mean, good Lord. (laughs) I can't help you. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But either go to your phone or go to this This book, Uh, if you don't have either of those right, I actually, I can't help you. There is a Bible in the pew in front of you. Take that with you. Take it home with you. Keep that and read it. Uh, Enjoy it. Um, And so I want to start this story in Genesis 27. We'll start in verse 1. Short bit of context. Uh, This is about, there's a story about Uh, A kid, a young guy, young man named Jacob, he has a twin brother whose name is Esau. Esau was Jacob's older brother in the sense that he just came out first, okay? He was older by about 45 seconds, right? Uh, uh, But he, and and, and when I say older, when when Esau uh, is birthed by his mother, Jacob literally has him by the heel, Right, so you're seeing something really interesting in when these two twins are born. Esau comes out first, and Jacob's got him by the heel, and he's just like, he's, he, he's I don't know if he's trying to pull him down or if he's trying to like uh, go out with him. Do you know what I'm saying? But you're, you're seeing something in that there's an imagery that gets to be revolved around this man named Jacob that he is kind of a sneaky guy, uh, and he does what he needs to do to get by. Uh, And he is constantly trying to take his brother's place. Uh, He just missed being the firstborn by a few seconds, my man. Um, And he's doing everything he can to to put himself back on top in not so righteous ways. Uh, Jacob and Esau's dad, his name is Isaac. Isaac was the promised son of Abraham and Sarah. Uh, They had Isaac when they were like, in their 90s, right? Uh, they had them as very old. They couldn't have kids for a very, very long time. Promised by God a son. Isaac is that son. Uh, and then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And this is a story about Jacob and Esau, but I want you to see it's also a story that settles in how profound a father's blessing is. How profound a father's blessing is. I want you to see in this story how profound the Father's blessing is in the life of human beings, okay? When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his oldest son, and he said to him, my son, and then he answered him. Esau said, here I am. And then Isaac says, behold, I'm old and I don't know when I'm gonna die. I don't know the day of my death. So take your weapons, your quiver and your bow. I want you to go out into the field and I want you to hunt game for me. Prepare for me delicious food that I love and bring it to me so that I can eat and that my soul may bless you before I die. You'll notice here the blessing comes from the soul. It doesn't just come from the mouth. 
the mouth brings into the physical, the internal blessing of the soul. Uh, so that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebecca was listening. Rebecca is Isaac's wife. Rebecca is uh, Jacob and Esau's mother. Rebecca also uh, is a little sneaky, okay? So the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree in Jacob's life. Uh, so let's watch this. Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. And so when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebecca called Jacob, the younger son, over, and she said, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau, so bring him some game and prepare delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. So now, therefore, Jacob, my son, obey my voice as I command you. I want you to go to the flock, bring me two, two good young goats, so that I may prepare from them a delicious food for your father, just like he loves. And you, you bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. So uh, notice, right? Notice Rebecca, sneaky as she is, um, she recognizes that there is something profound in the words that are going to come out of Jacob's mouth, okay? She recognizes there's something so, proud, so profound in the blessing of the father, in the father's words over his children. There's something so profound in it that she's willing to be devious. She's willing to go to the younger son and say, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prepare some, I mean, have any of you in this room ever taken a goat, like a living goat uh, from goat to table? Have you ever done that? Yeah. You yeah. <laughs> have. Yeah, only once in my life have I ever gone from goat to table. Yeah, it was a traumatic experience for me. And it, was, and it was just kind of good to eat as well. Uh, yeah. You know, we took a goat onto a field on Easter morning at, at dawn and uh, we prayed over it and we, we slid its throat and we skinned it. Crazy, right? I'm just, this is the Bible, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and we roasted it over a spit for about eight hours. Uh, and my good friend, um, who's, who's Greek, his, his dad came over and made all this delicious Greek food. And, uh, and after all that, we ate that goat at about 7 p.m. that night. It was okay. <laughs> just okay but it was a long process from goat to table it was a long process um and so rebecca is willing to to do that process with two goats uh it's a lot of work it's a lot of work and, but she knows the she knows the value of the words that come out of the father's mouth she knows the value of them she knows the power of them and apparently jacob recognizes it too Right, uh, But Jacob says to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau, he's hairy. And then what does Jacob say about himself? Esau's a hairy man, but I'm a smooth man. <laughs> That's in more ways than one, I guess. I say that about myself quite often, you know. I'm a smooth man. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just having fun. Um, but I'm a smooth man. Perhaps my father that he, he will feel me and it'll look to him like I'm mocking him. And he, instead of bringing a blessing, will bring a curse upon me. And his mother said back to him, if that happens, let your curse be on me, my son. Just do what I'm telling you to do. Obey my voice and go bring me those goats. Bring them to me. So like I said, uh, let's define blessing real, real, real quick. It's very broad, big idea in the Old, in the Old Testament and big idea in the New Testament. But let's just go to like what the word means. Foundationally, that word means to verbally, to verbally bind a positive reality on somebody. Okay, uh, in 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 Greek, in the in the word that the, uh, in the language the New Testament was written in, it's the word eulogia. It's made of two words: eu, you, which just means good; logia, words, good words in its fundamental sense. But the concept is that there are good words that bind the positive reality onto a person. Okay. Uh, we get our word eulogy from that word, okay? Right? Sadly, though, sadly, though, in our culture, we don't know what blessing is, really. Uh, we know what a eulogy is, and we say a bunch of nice words over a dead body. Uh, and I think, sadly, in our culture, there are more nice words said over dead bodies than they're ever said to people's faces. I honestly think that's true. I think we are very uncomfortable saying nice words to the face of people, um, and we are happy to say negative words about them when they're gone, 
We typically don't say nice words about them to their face, but then when they die, how many of you, and I hope I'm not hitting anything that's too sensitive, but how many of you have been to a funeral, and during the eulogy, you're like, (laughs) we're talking about the same person? Like, we're talking about the same person here. You know what I'm saying, don't you? But that's, that's the concept. It's not just good words. It's the binding. It's the putting on of a positive reality through speaking. That's where the word itself is rooted, and that's where the word comes from. In our culture, it's come to mean doing a nice thing for a person. And I agree that deeds should follow words, or else the words are empty, no doubt about it. But fundamentally, a blessing is verbal. Fundamentally, a blessing is verbal. Uh, and then if, if, you, if you want to, which I think you should, you should often follow a verbal blessing with a deed, right? You often should do that. But in its fundamental concept is you are binding a physical positive reality onto a person with your words. So, right, there's an aspect of that that I understand. There's an aspect of that that I understand. Ivy, could I borrow you? Where'd you go? Oh, my gosh, she snuck up on me. Uh, Ivy's going to set some things up for us. Ivy, uh, she just lives to help me out with my images. She came in today and was like, Terrell, do you have an image? I, the Lord told me that you might have an image that you want me to help you out with. And I was like, indeed, I do, Ivy. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I'm so dumb. <laughs> Thank you, Ivy. Um, yeah, that's a round of applause appropriate for Ivy. Um, so the... There's, a, there's an aspect of this that I understand, and there's an aspect of this that I absolutely do not understand. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to level with you here. I'm going to spend most of this time on what I do understand, uh, because if I spend too much time on what I don't understand, then I'm just making things up, okay? Uh, and, I, and preachers do that. Preachers make things up, okay? I'm going to do as little of that as I possibly can today. Uh, but the, 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 the part of this that I do understand is the psychological impact of positive words in the life of a person. I do understand that. That makes sense to me, right? That absolutely makes sense to me. Um, and and if, you'll, if you'll go here with me for a minute, some of us are actually right now operating under the blessing of our fathers. There are a few of us in this room who had fathers who spoke positive words to us enough that we have a degree of strength when we face difficulty. We have a degree of strength when we face opposition. We have a degree of strength when people say negative things about us, where inside we're like, that's not true at all. And it doesn't bother me that you said that. Because we had our, we had our father speaking words over us that were positive, and they built us up inside so that we could face the difficulties of this world and the difficult people that we encounter. And so we live under the blessing of our fathers. If you guys remember, um, oh gosh, I just had it. Um, you know what I'm talking about? It's, uh, it's that wonderful movie. You was kind. You was smart. You was important. You know what I'm talking about? The help, right? Yeah. And there's that, there's that little girl and her... Uh, her nanny, the woman that took care of her, she would all the time, right? It's like, it's like the, it's the underlying aspect of that movie. She would take that little girl and say, you was kind, you was smart, you was important. And those words, they, they bound on to that girl. Do you know what I'm saying? Right? And they became a source of strength for that girl. The concept of prophecy is rooted in this same thing. The father's words over the Israelite nation. Him explaining who they are, even though they can't see it. Him giving future realities before they come to pass was a source of strength when they are overthrown by the Babylonian Empire, by the Assyrian Empire, and by the Persian Empire. When they are under harsh rule by the Romans, they're clinging on to the father's words They're clinging on to the Father's prophetic blessing over their nation, and it is a source of strength. And and if you'll follow me here, do you realize that the Israelites are the only people group that have been conquered over and 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 over again, taken from their land, brought to another land, brought back to their land, taken out of their land, brought to another land, taken back to their land, and then brought to another, and then they were removed from their land. The Israelites were removed from their land in 70 A.D., 
okay? And they existed without, without a nation for 1,900 years. No other nation has done it. There is no other people group on the planet that has existed without having a piece of land that is their nation. For, for 2,000 years. And the reason why is because God the Father spoke over that nation blessing and prophecy that became a source of strength for them that even though they lack ground to stand on, they exist. It's craziness, right? It's craziness. Uh, but some of us are actually operating under the curse of our fathers. Some of us are actually operating under the curse of our fathers. And you know this, negative words that are spoken to you that drag you down whenever something difficult happens. Do you know what I mean? You know when life gets really difficult and instead of positive words echoing in your mind, the negative words echo in your mind. The authority figure in your life he, he bounds you with a negative reality. So when you face difficulty, there's no voice inside you that says you were made for this, you can do this. There's a voice inside of you that says, I told you you would never amount to anything. So quit, stop trying. You know what I'm saying? And even still, there are many of us that may not live fully under that curse, but we're so busy, we're so busy reacting against those words, trying to prove those words wrong, even though our Father hasn't spoken them in 20 or 30 or 40 years but they still motivate actions in the day in and day out because we're actively trying to prove wrong the voice of negativity that's in our mind and in our hearts from our Father. And then maybe there's even more of us that are here. Some of us are operating under the vacuum of our Father's silence. Some of us are operating from the vacuum. It wasn't even good or bad, right? It just wasn't even there. Because maybe dad wasn't around, or maybe dad was around, but he wasn't around emotionally, he wasn't around mentally, and he wasn't around from a heartfelt place. And so whether it's silence, or actually strong verbal negativity, or strong verbal positivity, there is an impact, and there is a weight, and there's a psychological impact of the voice and the words of a father in the life of their children, and there is an impact in the words of our heavenly father over us as human beings, his children. Both of those are true. So I want to show you something about how God the Father operates so that we can also recognize what it looks like for us to operate as fathers and mothers and coaches and bosses because this translates beyond just the father. But for whatever reason, the impact of it is felt most severely in the mouths of fathers or in the vacuum of that. All right, so I want to show you something here. And, and, and keep this in your mind. This right here, it's pure oil. It's clean. It has a lot of functions. You can do a lot with it. Right? Uh, and this, this cup represents you. Uh, and it's what I'm going to call, it's your standing, okay? This is going to make more sense, but I just need you to get these words in your head. This is your standing. When I say standing, what I mean is this, is if you are, if you are people in this room who have submitted your life to Jesus, you follow Jesus, you have by faith received the sacrifice of his blood, the sacrifice of his body. If you have submitted to him, he's king, he's Lord of your life. You, you, you have become not just a Christian because you live in America, but you've become a Christ follower because of your submitted life to him and you've received by faith the forgiveness and the life that he provides, what we understand in this really mysterious, in this really beautiful sense, is this, that the way that God the Father sees us is he sees us as pure, without blemish. He sees us and interacts with us as if we were his own son, who was perfect and without blemish and pure. Does that make sense? So we have the boldness to approach God as if we are perfect. We have the ability to approach God and to call on his name and to ask him for things without the fear of him poking on our failures and saying, oh, cool, you want to ask me for that? Well, what about this? Do you know what I'm saying? Because by faith, we have the relationship with God the Father that Jesus had with God the Father. Because by faith, all of the perfection of Jesus has been ascribed to you. 
okay? So that's our standing. That's what we stand on that. I don't stand on my actions. I don't, stand, I, I don't approach God and be like, hey, I'm really good. Yeah. And I wear nice clothes to church, and I think you like that, God. And I, and I, nothing, about, like, nothing about me approaches God based on what I've done in my life. Okay? My standing is this. I approach him because of who I am in Jesus. And, and here, follow me real quick. You need to approach him that way too. You gotta stop approaching him with all your failures in mind. You gotta stop. There's no, it, 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 like, he doesn't see that. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't understand you in that way anymore. He does not, like, he doesn't go there with you anymore. In his mind, you are just as Jesus was and is. Okay, that's, that's the way you got to think about it. When you get up in the morning and it's like, I want to I read the Bible or I want to pray, and then all the thoughts about your own, your own failures and your negativity starts going through your mind, you immediately, thank you, Jesus, I receive your forgiveness for everything from yesterday and the day before and the day before and the day before. I'm approaching you, Father in heaven, as if you actually love me, and I'm approaching you as if I am that perfect being standing in you, okay? Here's the reality, though, right? And we gotta, we got to recognize both of these realities. we got to recognize both of these realities. That's our standing. That cup that's clear and pure. But this is our state. Okay? Some pure oil with a heavy dose of balsamic vinegar in there. So that's our state, though, isn't it? That's our standing over there. But this is the reality of our life. There's a heavy dose of darkness that's still in us. You know what I'm saying? There's a good bit of darkness that still motivates our actions. There's a good bit of darkness that still governs the way that we think about people. There's a good bit of darkness that governs the way that we think about ourselves. And that darkness has come because our father had that darkness in him. His grandfather had that darkness in him. Grandma had that darkness in her. Right? So that's our state. But that's our standing. Okay. That's the state that we live in right now. And here is what God is up to, right? I need you to understand this with me real quick. When God interacts with you, he interacts with you primarily from this place. When he thinks about you and talks to you about you, he is calling these things out in you. He is not over here reprimanding and going off and going nuts on the darkness, right? He is not condemning the darkness in you. He is verbalizing the goodness that not just that he sees you in Jesus. This is the other second part of this. It's beautiful. He is not just... It's not just he's like, oh, I, I put the Jesus lens on. That's part of it, it's, it, but it's not just that. This is also who you will become. This is your final state. This is when salvation is complete and you are glorified and you actually stand in his presence and you stand in his presence without falling down. You stand in his presence, actually, you will stand in the presence of God. Everywhere in the Bible that God shows up or an angel shows up, you know what people do? They fall on their face. And they're like, woe is me, I'm broken. They, all of this becomes really clear to them in a moment. Do you know what I'm saying? When Isaiah in Isaiah 6 has a vision of God himself in the temple, Isaiah 6, he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. Me and all the people around me, we got a problem. And I see it now in your presence. He falls down, God lifts him up. That's over and over in the Old Testament. It's over and over in the New Testament. It's in the, it's in the book of Revelation and the gospel, uh, or when John who wrote the book of Revelation, when he encounters a holy being on his face, and they're like, hey, stand up. But there will come a day when it's not just the way that God sees you will be like this, but you will actually be this way. But you know how you go from this state to this standing in reality? This has got to be dealt with. Okay? It's got to be dealt with. And let me tell you this. You have just as much ability in yourself to get rid of that as you have the ability to remove the balsamic vinegar from this oil. You can get a decent bit. 
but you're always going to have some residue in there. It takes the Spirit of God. It takes God the Father, the working of His Son, Jesus, to get rid of all that, right? So here's, here's where this goes wrong. I want to read something to you by a, it's a guy that I, I really love. His name's Richard Rohr. He says this. Here's the deal, right? When I, when I talk about darkness, I want you to understand something. Darkness is not simply the sinful things you do, okay? The wounds of the soul take a long, 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 long time to heal. And in many ways, only time can help. And patience. And, here it is, a certain difficult repentance. Hold on, sorry. This one gets me, man. A long, difficult repentance. Realization of life's mistake. And the freeing of oneself. God, the freeing of oneself from the endless repetition of that mistake. Whew. God is not looking at you saying, I'm so mad that that darkness is in you. He's looking at you saying, don't you want to be free from the endless repetition of it? Don't you want to be? Because I can, but you know where it goes wrong. The freeing of oneself from the endless repetition of life's mistake. Here it is. Which mankind at large has chosen to sanctify? Human beings at large, instead of saying, I want to be free of this darkness, they'll look you dead in the eye and say, there's no darkness there. And you know why? Because most of us operate in the vacuum of a father and we don't have the strength to acknowledge the darkness because it's so incriminating. It's such a source of insecurity. It's such a source of hurt. It's such a source of wounding. It's such a source of brokenness. It's such a source of difficulty that I, I don't even feel comfortable looking at it. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not like hiding because I want to be deceptive. It's hiding because I don't have the strength. I, like, I don't have it in me to look at it. And I hate myself when it comes out of me. And so, the, oh, the best thing I can do is just be like, it's not there. It's like, it's not there. So even for those of us who follow Jesus, we're prone to that, right? But also keep in mind, we live in a world that is actively trying to tell you that that darkness is okay. You live in a world that's actively trying to tell you it's fine. Be you. And I do want you to be you. I want to be me, but this is me. Okay, do you follow me here? This is not you. This is a corrupted version of you. This is you. And you can't make you into you. And you can't go on enough vacations to find you. And you, and you can't get the right job that will reveal you. You, there, there is no finding of yourself. Now, there is the difficult moments in our life when all of this comes up to the surface. That's true. You find yourself in marriage. You find yourself when you got three kids. You find yourself when you got six kids and all this stuff, ain't, it's not down there at the bottom anymore. It's bubbling over. It's, it's getting thrown up on everybody around you. So here, I want to I I dive in in a very specific way. Uh, specifically two fathers and, and, and four fathers in this room, and for those of you who had fathers, and for those of you who didn't have fathers. So this is for everybody. <laughs> the reason that I, God, the reason that I, my voice does this when I read this, I've seen in the life of my oldest son This endless repetition that every time I see this, even just I get a smell of it, you know what I do? I lash out on him. Every time I get a, a whiff of that darkness, every time he does something that's just a little bit selfish, or every time he does something that reminds me of me whenever I was 13 or 9, 
instead of saying, that's who you are in the Lord. Father, who is my son going to be? Will you give me a vision of what he will be when he stands before you? Will you give me a vision of what he'll be when he's 50 years old? Will you give me a vision of what you have in mind for him to be? Okay. And then I go to the darkness when he is acting a fool. He acts a fool, man, like he does. Just like me, just like you, just like all of us. And I'm supposed to bring that vision, and it's supposed to come out in words. Hey, buddy, when you did that, it's not ignoring it. It's not ignoring it. But it's creating an environment of covenant love that says, you can show that and I won't reject you. You can show that, and I won't lash out on you. You can show that, and I won't, like, I'm not kicking you out of the house for it, right? You can show it, and then let's deal with it together. Over and over, the endless repetition of life's mistake in my life is that I see it, it causes me anxiety, it causes me fear, it causes me anger, and so I lash out on it. And you know what happens to him? Whoop! He stuffs it. And so I speak curses over my oldest son instead of speaking blessing over him. You know what I'm saying? So when I, see, when I say that I understand the psychological effects of the curse and the blessing, that's what I mean. I can see moments in my kid's life, and I can see him now in my fourth when the darkness comes out of him in his little four-year-old way, I've had a little more practice. I've had the, the long, difficult repentance now for, for nine years of every time that I lash out, I'm going to him and repenting, and I'm going to my Father in heaven and repenting, and I'm receiving the forgiveness of Jesus for it. And you know what's happening is I'm slowly getting better at blessing and not cursing. I'm slowly getting better at recognizing my children through the lens of who they will be in Christ and not through the lens of their greatest mistake. And I'm getting better at actually speaking from that place as opposed to speaking against that place. Because the reality is, if we, if we lash out, react, or if we refuse to acknowledge, the other side of that is that many of us had fathers who did lash out, who did react, who did go nuts when they shouldn't have. And so we choose a different path of fatherhood. We allow them to sanctify it. We allow them to pretend that it's not there. And we don't like looking at it either, so we lie to ourselves about it actually being there. And so we don't play the role of father and mother that we ought to because we're just letting it be instead of partnering with the Spirit of God to invite them out of that so that they're freed from that endless repetition of life's mistakes that the world wants them to call holy and good, but it'll actually kill them. Man. I, I actually want to get to the part that I don't understand. Um, but I, can we, can we just do something real quick? Can we pray for a minute? Would that be okay? Uh, can we stop the sermon and just pray for a minute? Because um, there's about four places that I would love for the Lord to just, just touch in you. So if you are, if you're specifically right now, we can go beyond this, but right now, if you're a man, and I'm not going to make you call yourself out, I'm not going to do that right now, but if you're a man in this room who walks with a source of defensiveness where you don't want to acknowledge your own failures, or you walk with a degree of insecurity, uh, not able to acknowledge your own failures, or you walk with just a source of woundedness because those words were never spoken over you that would have given you strength, I just want to pray for you, right? I just want to pray for you, specifically the men in the room, if that's okay. Uh, this hits women for sure, without a doubt. But it hits men in a really, 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 really tough way. 
And so if you would, if, let me, let me, I just want to pray. Uh, so Father, we, uh, we come to you as, as, as really loved sons right now. Oh, thank you for it. And I'm asking that you would, Father, in the name of Jesus, that you would speak in, in very delicate, sensitive, specific words to the people in this room, to the guys in this room, uh, who had either an aggressive father or had a, a father that just didn't say anything at all. God, I'm asking that you would, in the name of Jesus, that you would begin to touch their soul and their heart and their mind, and that you would become to them a father that their earthly father wasn't. I'm asking that you would do that. And I'm asking you, Jesus, that you would, by your spirit, that you would begin to do exactly what Galatians says and Romans says, that your spirit in the men in this room would cry out, Abba, Father, would actually cry out to God, you are my dad, God, you're my dad. You're not just God, judge, creator, whatever. I'm willing for you to be my dad, and I want you to be my dad because I need a dad's voice over me uh, for the rest of my life. I can't live apart from that. I can't live with the words of the angry dad. I can't live, I, I need your voice, God. And so I'm asking that you would, in the name of Jesus, that you would, by your spirit, do what you promised to do, God. You made, a, you made a deposit in us that was your spirit, and you said that spirit has a function, that, that the spirit of God is a person but has a function inside of us. That there would be this resonating connection and relationship built internally between you and us. And so if you're willing, even if you just keep having your eyes closed, uh, we do this thing occasionally. I want to repent on behalf of your father. I want to repent as a father. Uh, and so I repent and stand in the place of your father. And I ask you for forgiveness. I ask you to forgive me for not knowing what to do with your darkness. I ask you to forgive me for not speaking into it in the right way. I ask you to forgive me for hiding my face. I ask you for forgive I ask you to forgive me for carrying on a pattern that I got from my dad. And I ask you for grace in the name of Jesus to cover that. I ask you for grace in the name of Jesus. That you would forgive me. And that you would allow the blood of Jesus to cover that. And so if you're a woman in this room that needs that same thing, and that voice, and the absence of that voice, or that too strong a voice, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me. I didn't know what it was like to love a daughter. I didn't know what it was like to correct a daughter. I didn't know how to speak into a daughter. I had my own stuff that I did not have to deal with. And so I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me, that you would extend grace and that you would extend mercy. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You knew exactly what you were doing on a cross. You knew exactly what you were doing when you, when you took what you took. And so we say right now that we will view our fathers and we will view our mothers and we will view our coaches and we will view our bosses, and we will view those, every, every single one of those who are in authority and who did not address us according to our standing, but they addressed us according to our state. 
we willingly give forgiveness to them right now in the name of Jesus. We forgive them. Just as we've been freely forgiven, we extend forgiveness in the name of Jesus. And we're not even asking really for help to forgive. You gave help when you went to a cross. You gave help when you gave us your spirit. We're making a choice now to release an offense. We're making a choice to release an offense. And as we release that offense and as we administer forgiveness right now to those who addressed us in a way that was not helpful and actually added more darkness to the mix, we forgive in the name of Jesus. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to establish a relationship of covenant, faithful love with our Father in heaven that we would grow to know him as Father and not just God. And would you establish that in this room? And the men, would you establish that in this room? And the women, would you establish that in this room? And the children, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. I legit don't want to preach the rest of this sermon. <laughs> I'm not. Um, I kind of want to worship for a little bit. I kind of want to worship for a little bit. Um, Yeah, so guys, if you all make your way up, that'd be great. We're going to do this. The band's just going to play for a little bit. Um, that, that time, just so you understand kind of the way that we're wired here, sometimes the band is just going to play. That's just a time for you to pray, interact with God. There's not a lot of time to interact with God in our day. I get it. That, that's, that's what that's there for. We'll jump into some worship and they'll lead us and it'll be wonderful. Uh, but if there is a particular place in you that was like, I don't know, just kind of hit, um, and you know the words to pray, would you just, would you pray them? Would you, you have your own personal relation with God? If, if I said in general something, but there's something real specific that needed to be said, um, please say that specific thing to God. Uh, if, you have, if you have trouble finding the words, but you know that you, like, you need something, um, let's have the prayer room in the back again. Uh, not the prayer room, let's have the prayer team in the back. So if you're on the prayer team, they'll kind of stand along the back wall. And if you just need somebody to kind of guide you in prayer, prayer is very powerful. Um, very, very meaningful, very, very powerful. It's essential. Um, but a lot of times we don't necessarily have the words to pray because we've not been taught to pray in, in, in many respects. Uh, and so there'll be people at the back that can kind of help you in it. Um, if not, right, if there's nothing, nothing heavy, you know what I mean? Great, just, just enjoy the space. Enjoy the quiet moment. Enjoy God's presence, you know what I mean? And, 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 and pray for the people in this room because I think there are some, there are some, ways that we've been affected in this room. There's some ways that we've been affected that we don't want to sanctify and continue living in. So, uh, so guys, if you'd stand. Um, so Jesus, we honor your presence here and soften ourselves to you. We're yours, and and we want you to heal us. And we depend on you for it. And we're desperate for you to do it, because you're the only one that can. And so we soften ourselves, and we pull the lid off of the things that we stuff for just a quick moment for you to explore and bring to the surface what you want to deal with. Thank you for your softness, Jesus, in the way that you do that.